You might know him from the Goldbergs, from Hangover 1 and 2, from the Fire of the Kid. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the best comedian breathing on planet Earth. Put your hands together for Brian Kelly! My children, please. What a wow, what a re rousing reception. Thank you. It's so amazing, man. I just like, you know, you kind of you're watching it and you're like, I kind of made it. You know what I mean? It's just weird. But it's funny because that stuff can go to your head. I was just, you know, you feel so good. I've been meditating. Um, so I don't know if I seem unusually centered, but my my chakras, especially my root chakra, I apologize for the heat, but I breathe. <laughs> I know, it's amazing though. I've been meditating and I'm working with this Tibetan monk and he's uh, a Buddhist. He's teaching me to release myself of attachment to, because attachment to the physical world is where suffering comes from. You're all suffering. And, but he's teaching me that this is all an illusion. It's incredible. So to release yourself of attachment is, I, it's, I've been doing it for a year. It's so amazing. It's great for stress and it's, but it's getting in the way of my life a little bit. Like I've gotten to the point where like I don't give a shit about my kids anymore. <laughs> I know, and my wife is like, you're a bad dad. And I'm like, I know, but I'm so happy. <laughs> I know, so get them out of my office because they're an illusion anyway. <laughs> Freaking kids, they're awesome, but they ruin everything. Well, because you love them so much. I don't like loving something that much. It's weird to have like two people in your life whose happiness is more important than your own and their mother's more important than me too. She's their mother and my kids are small, so she's way more important. They need their mommy. She cannot, nothing can happen to her. I have to die. Shh, shh. I, it's weird, I have to die. She, I don't care if I catch her in bed with four dudes at the same time. If she, until they're 18, if she needs both my kidneys, I gotta be like, ah, you know? Like, literally, she can't die. I have to die. If she dies, they gotta die. <laughs> I'm too busy. I don't know how to take care of two kids. <laughs> but that's the thing, man. It's a big responsibility. Like, I feel like I gotta make the world a better place now. Not for me. I'm doing amazing. But for them. <laughs> Maybe if we work together, we can solve some of the world's problems. It's not all about comedy, is it? Let's try, like, let's talk about equality. Apparently, we still have some work to do in that area, according to the news. I don't, listen, I'll be honest, as a white landowner, I don't see it. <laughs> I don't know. But I think, I think we have to be honest about, if we're really serious about equality, we have to talk about some uncomfortable things. First of all, I don't think racism is actually the problem. Let me, let me explain. I don't think racists are getting in the way of the big picture. They're very, they're, I don't know any, I really seriously don't know any real racists. Like racists, the ones that march, they're, they're obvious. They're so easy to see in a crowd. First of all, they have very small heads, okay? <laughs> And they're very stiff. You ever notice how they're very like racist or not? They're very, they've made up their mind. I have all the answers, so their bodies are stiff too. That's what happens. That, like, you ever notice how really inclusive people, like if you go to the other end of the spectrum, like hippies at a, at a festival when they dance? <laughs> you know what I mean? They look like seaweed. They're too, they're too inclusive, fucking communists. <laughs> But, but racists can't dance. They can't even walk. They're so stiff. Their bodies, they don't bend anything. Even when they walk, they're like, I'm going over here. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, that's, I don't think, I don't, it's more subtle than that. If we're going to be honest about equality and solve that problem or make progress, we have to be honest about how complicated we are as human beings. Human beings, we are a complicated, multi-dimensional ape. And we have to be honest with it. Like there's just certain things about 
like there are certain uncomfortable or maybe awkward truths that I feel like we're not allowed to really even say. But you know what? I got the mic, so let me just... <laughs> but I'll go through a couple of things, man. Like, first of all, like, I'm not racist at all, but I'll just give you, let me give you my perspective. I was just thinking about how I think. I think I'm a very fair-minded person, but of course I'm not racist, but I make racial assumptions. Like, if I see a white guy in a Rolls Royce, I assume he's either a chauffeur or a dick. <laughs> and here's another assumption. I assume, I assume that most black men don't own cats. <laughs> You don't look at a brother like cat owner. You've never done that. <laughs> and here's another assumption. If you are a black man and you own cats, you're gay. <laughs> right? And, you know, and I was thinking about, like, discrimination and prejudice. Like, I don't believe in discrimination, but sometimes it's necessary. I'll give you a couple examples, okay? I don't care if you give half your money to charity. I don't care if you won Citizen of the Year award and you got a medal around your neck. If you have a face tattoo, you ain't babysitting my kids. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, man? Sometimes you have to discriminate against somebody for the way they look. And that's a fact, especially if they're trying to be your nanny, okay? Because my wife and I were interviewing nannies, and a young lady showed up at the door, and she was fucking astonishing. <laughs> no, she was so good looking. Like, she was so, I'm just being honest as a man. She was so, like, it, she was, like, I, when I, I embarrassed myself, because I opened the door, and I went, I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm telling you, man, and in that moment, I was so weak. If she had looked at me and been like, just so you know, I have hep C, I shoplift, and I love crack, I would have been like, we'll figure it out. <laughs> I know, and then we interviewed her, and my wife was like, I like her. I was, I was like, I love her. <laughs> Which is why she ain't getting the job. <laughs> I know, and it got tense. My wife stopped. She goes, what are you talking, what are you saying? I can't trust you? You're saying I can't trust you? Really? I was like, of course you can trust me. You can always trust me. But if a hurricane blows long and hard enough, even the strongest seawall can be breached. <laughs> it's an engineering problem. <laughs> and I'm a pervert. We're complicated apes, man. We have to remember that. And we're too judgmental. And we're too quick to assassinate somebody off of a moment. And that's my problem with everybody having phones with cameras and social media. Because the public square is ruthless. And it loves destruction. Yes. And I hate it. I hate it. It's not good for our culture and it's not good for us because all of us have moments, my God. And all of us, everybody here has at least 10 thoughts an hour or a minute that would get you fired. Because that's what it is to be a human being, man. Sometimes you just want to say something appalling just because, just because you're not allowed to. <laughs> you ever do that? When you're with your friend, you're like, man, and your friend's like, dude, and you're like, I know. <laughs> I've said things in my own home to my wife in fights that were just appalling, okay? But everybody knows that's what happens when you share a roof with somebody, when you have an argument with somebody and they know every detail about you. They just can get you when you're trying to have arguments. My wife's, she's a bad person. <laughs> Dude, she, she's a nasty fighter, because we'll, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain myself, I'm trying to stick to the ground rules, and not freak out and burn down the whole fucking house, <laughs> and I'm trying to keep myself calm and explain my point of view, and she'll start looking at me like I'm an exotic zoo animal, she'll, she'll look at me and go, wow, you're still talking, <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing, <laughs> I'll do the jail time right fucking now. <laughs> I, don't believe, I don't believe in domestic violence. I don't even think it's funny, man. 
but a little domestic roughness. I'm not asking for a lot, but if I could pull your face off your face. Feel so good in this area. But you can't do that. So then what you do is you end up, I, I end up turning the aggression back on myself because I don't, I don't know where else to go. You ever, you ever get so crazy and angry at somebody that you want to, it would be worth dying at them? Like you want to, you want to make them, it'd be worth making them sad. Like I'm, you want to, you don't know what to do. You, you want to take a knife and stick it in your fucking temple. It'd be worth a half second of her going, no, miss me now, bitch, and just die. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think some people have been there. Listen, uh, we had a blowout fight, and I couldn't finish the argument because I had to catch a plane, which is the worst. A, a blowout. And I was like, no, you're mischaracterizing what I'm saying as usual. God damn it. I'm sending you 15 texts, and you better read all 15 of them. And she just looks at me and she goes, where are you going? Where am I going? I gotta catch a plane, obviously, so I can pay for all this shit. You're welcome. <laughs> and she's an assassin. She's an assassin. She doesn't move and she just goes, well, have a great flight. <laughs> have a great flight? Yeah? You know what? I beg God, I ask, I implore him to take my plane and drive it right into the fucking ground. <laughs> and she's like, don't say that. Don't do that. Why? That's way better than this bullshit. <laughs> and know that as my plane is careening to the ground, no, I will be smiling, number one. <laughs> and number two, if I'm sitting anywhere near a woman, I swear on my life. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We're in therapy. But here's the point. The point is that I asked God to crash my commercial airliner, but I'm not a fucking terrorist. I was just having a moment, man. We have to be more forgiving. That's what I'm saying. If we're going to get if we're going to get serious about equality, we better be more forgiving. Cuz we're complicated, man. We are we are, and, and you have to take that into account. We are a complicated, multidimensional, multi-layered, ever-changing, full of potential ape. And it's so important, but we don't treat each other that way. We, we turn each other into nouns. Because when you turn somebody into a noun, a fixed thing, it's easier to categorize. That's what we do. Liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, traitor, pussy, asshole. <laughs> Immigrant, Muslim, white, black, brown, Latino, Asian. 48 countries in Asia, but you know what we mean. <laughs> yeah. Be more general. Was Earthling taken? <laughs> Unbelievable. Transgender, transsexual, genderqueer, <gasps> straight white male. <laughs> oh, shit. Patriarch, oppressor, privileged. And I get it, man. I understand. I understand that there is, a, there is a benevolent impulse to categorize because a lot of people are like, dude, guys like me, we've been included. And there are a lot of people that haven't been. So the idea is let's create categories and make sure everybody's included. But that's never going to work, man. It's never going to work because no matter how inclusive you get, you will always leave categories out. We're too complicated, man. I'll tell you, as an example, I'll tell you what category always gets left out. No matter how inclusive, no matter how politically correct, dwarves. <laughs> that's a fact. My buddy's a dwarf. He's uh, about that high. He's got no neck, first of all, okay? He doesn't. His email's No Neck Dave. He's hilarious. Very funny comic. He's got a hunchback, and his heart's on the wrong side of his body, okay? Yeah, life ain't easy for No Neck Dave. I've talked to him. Let me tell you something. He's a straight white male, but he would way rather be a tall black woman with a straight spine. <laughs> That's a fact. 
And then again, and then again, he's got it hard, but it can always get harder. There's a category that gets it harder. Let me tell you something. I remind him of that every time he complains. I'm always like, look, I know you got it hard, but you could be a black dwarf with no neck. <laughs> you could be a black female dwarf with no neck. You could be a black female dwarf with no neck and allergies. So check your white privilege, you lucky motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, you see that? You can't use a gender code, you can't use a color code. It only tells you a small piece of No Neck Dave's story. <laughs> it's true, man. I mean, I was thinking about this. I did my genome recently, because I'm white, right? But my mother's 100% Sicilian. And when my genome came back, I was like, I had a mix of everything, man. I had a lot of North African, Turkish, Iberian, it's a mix, man. And that side of my family, they do not look privileged, I'll tell you that much. They're a small people. They're, they look, they're bent. They look like they're walking through rain, all of them. <laughs> Every picture, they're in clumps looking for an angle. <laughs> Short fingers made for the manual arts, like weaving and digging and scrubbing. No musicians in my whole family tree. Nobody has the finger length. <laughs> I know. And I think about this because I married a Viking. Yeah, one of the whites, a, re a white from the north, the kind of white that blends with snow. The white. Her ancestors drank from skulls and worshiped Thor. She's a powerful woman. My wife is powerful. She's built for the battlefield and the farm. She is. And I was, my kids are going to be first round draft picks, no question. But I was putting sunblock on my kids the other day, man. And it was after, it was after all this the racist incident in the, uh, in the news. And I was feeling like we were breaking apart. And I was nervous for my children. And as I was putting sunblock on my children, I found myself wishing I had bred with a darker woman. <laughs> I know, not because of the money I'd save on sunblock, but... But just because the sun is getting hotter and the world is getting browner, and I, think, I feel like pink is a bad color for the revolution, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, you know, the sun, my kids, they got none of my Italian genes. Like, they got, they just, her Viking genes are like, get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> like, they have some Italian. Like, they get emotional sometimes and they catch colds easily. That's about it. <laughs> but they got, they're pink. And they're Vikings, and their son, like the son for the Viking is their kryptonite. They can't handle the sun and the northern white uh, uh, and spices. <laughs> Even black pepper, they're like, bah! they freak out. <laughs> and rhythm. I don't know what it is, but when you're that far away from the equator, this area shuts down. I don't know if they got to get ready for the winter or whatever. Just the shoulders move, and they look like they're getting water out of each ear. You know what I mean? First time I danced with my wife, she was hot, and I thought, I can dance. I'm a fuck it, I'm gifted, I can get low. I'm, I'm from, I'm of the earth, you know what I mean? No, 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 I don't have time. I don't have room. But I was dancing with my wife, man, I don't know what the fuck she was listening to. She was doing shit. I was like, what are you, she looked like she was conjuring spirits, I swear to God. She was doing shit, I was like, you have to stop this, you're gonna open a portal to hell, this is not safe. I don't want BLs about to be like, eh. <laughs> And I went up to Scandinavia. It's beautiful. Beautiful people, beautiful place. But when you get up there around the winter months, it gets dark at noon. You know what I mean? Like you wake up 9 a.m. It's like, good morning, noon, good night, you know? <laughs> and I wonder, I always wondered why people move that far north. Because life started in East Africa according to most evolutionary biologists. And you see what I just did, by the way? I've read all the literature, but you see what I just did? I just went like that for East Africa. I lumped that whole area in with a circle, like they're all black, so they're the same. That's what we do. There are about six countries, maybe seven in East Africa, depending on who you ask. And that is a very culturally very culturally and physically diverse part of the world, man. Incredibly so. And I'll tell you why I think about this. Because, like, say I went to East Africa and I, I decided to adopt a baby. Say, say I was, well, the reason I bring this up is I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of white Hollywood celebrities are now adopting black babies from Africa. Because, you know, they're making a div. 
I know, it's amazing. The more famous you are, the more black. It's like an accessory. You know what bugs me about that besides fucking everything? It can never be an American black baby, ever. They can drive 20 minutes to South Central and get them all out of foster care. Yeah, but no. No, they have to fly all the way to Africa. Way more romantic. And here's what's fascinating about that. They almost always adopt from Ethiopia. Now, that's not an accident. I'm cynical, but I'm sorry. I lived in the Middle East for eight years of my life. I'll tell you something about Ethiopia, Eritrea. They are beautiful people. Oh, they're, they're known for their beauty. They're famed for it. And they grow to a, an average height. Here's what's fascinating about East Africa. If I just step over the border just from here and right here, if I go to an orphanage here and in an orphanage here, now I'm in the Sudan, okay? And that's home to the Dinka and the Nua, tallest people in the world. I'm talking about people that can eat peanuts off a Dutchman's head, okay? <laughs> mm-hmm. And they're beautiful people. But when you adopt a baby from Sudan, the problem if you're a celebrity is by the time the kid's 14, you got a giant on your hands, okay? That's a problem if you're a celebrity because when People Magazine comes to do your family portrait to show the world how racist you're not, <laughs> they gotta shoot you on a wide angle lens because you got your small celebrity family, then Ndwane, and then the rest. <laughs> so anyway, when I say East Africa, I mean Kenya. <laughs> and I guess there was a group of Kenyans that just kept walking north. I don't know why, you know? You always wonder about the psychological profile. Maybe it was a charismatic leader who was like, let's just keep walking north. Forget Spain and France. I just, I hear it gets dark at noon if we keep going. I want it to be so cold it hurts my face. I want to wear mittens 10 months of the fucking year. <laughs> and there are big people up in Scandinavia, man. My wife, she's, I resent her bone structure. She, she has legs that are made to navigate heavy terrain. She does, like if I had to fight her, if I had to fight her on even ground where I could move in and out and catch angles, I think I could, I think I could beat her ass. But, but if I had to fight her in deep snow, never fight a Viking in deep snow. That woman can hip deep. She's got a long femur bone. That bitch can blaze through snow, man. <laughs> I get stuck in snow. I have a short femur bone. I got no Viking. I come from a long line of Italian and Irish peasantry. My legs are not made for the battlefield. They're made for serving and hiding. <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> The sex with the Viking is humbling. I put it down, don't kid yourself, I'm filthy, but still. I, she, I just, no matter what, I, I put in work, and no matter what I'm doing, she's just such a thoroughbred. I just, I always feel like, I always feel a little bit like a dusty pony that broke into the corral, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I think women have that power. That's an incredible power. A woman can just make a man feel like a champion. And then the next day, you're doing the same stuff, putting in the same effort, same vein in your forehead, and... <laughs> What, for whatever reason, she's looking at you like you're a refugee on a work visa. <laughs> right? Tolerated, but not welcome. <laughs> anyway, anyway, the point is, I wish my kids were browner. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> we're too... Because we're, we're, just, we're just fighting too much. And the other point is, there are different kinds of just white. You can't use that. It's too broad a brush. Culture. You can use a culture code to an extent. That's not as broad a brush. If you know people's culture, you can point to general truths. Like there are big differences in white culture. Like the difference between a white dude from Denver and a white dude from Russia. That's it. That's a universe. I was in Denver and these two white dudes came out of a brewery, of course. And they were smiling, of course. Because Americans, white Americans, we come from a very optimistic culture. We're raised to believe you can be anything you want to be. And Russians are like, no. <laughs> and he's, this white dude came out and he goes like this. He goes, what a day, huh? And his buddy goes, I know, right? And then the guy goes, bro, you know what we should do? 
let's go to the aquarium. <laughs> and his friend goes, right on. And they bounce down the street towards what I believe was the aquarium. <laughs> I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not a criminal, but I, I wanted to rob them for no reason. Like that. <laughs> In the history of Russia, I don't have the data, but I promise you, I promise you this is true. Never has a man walked outside and been like, hey, it's a beautiful day. I want to see fish. <laughs> that certain cultures get away with certain things. Like certain cultures get away with flirting, I think, more than others. Like my, my buddy's from Spain, and that is a romantic culture. That's a kind of, you know, like... I don't know anything. I've never been there, but I have these images of being Spanish. You know, I want to be, I want to dance. I want to, hey, I want to, I want to fuck. They fucking, they fight bulls and they do flamenco. You ever see, I don't even know. What the fuck is that? I don't know, but it makes me believe in God. And they got a guy going, I fucking want to, uh, I want to be that. I want somebody to go, what do you do for a living? I want to go, I dance. <laughs> I want to be a tyrannical dance teacher. That's the other thing. I'm getting too old to be a dancer, but I'd love to just be the kind of guy who says shit like, again! <laughs> You're a good dancer, Rafael, but only you can decide if you will be a great dancer. Again! No, my feet. I've been dancing for six hours. My feet are broken. You are a monster. Then don't dance with your feet. Dance with your heart. <laughs> And my buddy, you can learn from him. He's so romantic. He's on his heels. He's never, he's never aggressive. He's, it's so, he's just, your beauty is too much. Like, he's like, you are too, you are too beautiful for me, you know? I can't look to you because my eyes, you know, is, is too much. You know, when, when I look to you, I have to call the doctor because my heart, my heart, it makes like... <laughs> certain cultures are tough, man. The men of certain cultures, Russians, Armenians, Israelis, tough people, been through some stuff. Mexicans, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, man, you, listen, you know, if you got a fight, you got a choice between fighting a man from France or a man from Mexico. Law of averages says to go with Pierre. <laughs> Boxing's a popular sport in Mexico, man. I don't know what it is about that culture, but I, I'm a huge fight fan, if you watch, if you watch people from, of Mexican origin who fight in box or MMA, they, I don't think the Mexican school of fighting ever teaches you to move back. There's no, they, they just keep moving. They'll fight you in a phone booth and fucking die. It's amazing. No. I'm still stereotyping though. I'm not telling you shit about the individual. And that's the problem with a culture code, and a color code, and a gender code. And that's the thing. And I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, because we're using a lot of nouns, stereotypes, for our neighbors, our southern neighbors across the border. And that's a contentious issue. It's an emotional issue, borders. You know, that's, that shit is like phew, dividing people up. And I think it's because, because I think all of us believe in borders to an extent. All of us. Otherwise, you know, th that's why you have a front door and a lock on your house, right? We all have borders, but that's different. That's emotionally complicated because I think as Americans and people, we're weighing two different values. You know what I mean? We're weighing mercy and compassion and justice and fair play. And sometimes there's no room for both and it sucks. I feel the same way. Like I believe in borders, but personally, I'd be a shitty border control agent. And I know that. I'm too emotional. I am. I talk a big game. I'd be like, nobody comes across the border. I'm sorry. You got to wait in line. That's just the way it is. Like everybody else, rules are rules. And then I'd be like, oh, they have the kids. <laughs> no. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make me, I just, I just am, I'm, I'm a weakling that way. And I think a lot of us feel that way, man. And I had a really interesting experience because I was, my buddy's a contractor. And I went to where he works and these dudes were working. They were building a house. And I saw this guy digging, this thick dude. I, I noticed him. He was, he was about five, four, about five feet wide. Looked like a human fist. <laughs> yeah, 
no points. I'm pointy. He had no points, just blunt. And, and he was pulling up huge chunks of the earth, just, hey, hey. And I, I know digging. I had to bury my dog once. I, 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 and I love my dog. I had my dog for 11 years, and I wanted to give her a dignified, proper burial. I got, I got down about a foot and a half, and I was like, oh, this is so fucking hard. <laughs> It was also the playoffs. I didn't have time. But here's the thing. But I, I know how hard that is. And so I'm admiring the power in this dude. And I said to my buddy, I go, what, what, what is he digging, man? And the, my, my buddy, who's his boss, goes, a pool. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking, like, that I can go like that in? He goes, oh, yeah, man, he'll do it in an afternoon. I was like, it's not possible. He goes, it's not, it's not possible. But for him, it is. <laughs> And I go, that's the most insane thing I've ever heard. And he goes, yeah, bro, that's why I can't fire him. He works too hard. He's too good. And I go, fire him? Why would you fire him? And he goes, well, he's illegal, man. He's here from Mexico he, illegally. He's an illegal alien. And this is the first thing I want to say. I got up close to this dude. When you get up close to an illegal alien, I got real close to him. This dude looked so human. <laughs> it was weird. But it was crazy. It was weird, but listen, I know, but check it out, man. And he was digging and, and I, I said, there's no way he can do this because I, I, I admire that kind of power. And he, he just kept getting lower and lower. I mean, the boy, he was three hours in, I could see that much of his head and he's just throwing water and he, he hadn't taken a break. And I was like, this is fucking nuts, man. Hey bro, you want some water or something? And the guy goes, no, it's okay, amigo, thank you. <laughs> I was like, get that guy a green card right now. I don't give a shit if I have to marry him. That guy stays in my country. <laughs> right? Look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm not making a political statement. All I'm saying is you are not keeping that guy out with a wall. <laughs> He'll dig right under it in an afternoon. There's got to be a better way, man. There's got to be a better way. So what do we do? What are the answers, man? I don't know. I don't have the answers. But I'll tell you what we shouldn't do. I'll tell you where the answers don't lie. They don't lie in sitting in your left wing or your right wing echo chamber, surrounded by people who see the world exactly like you do, giving the other side the finger. Because let me tell you something, nothing moves forward that way. What we need in this country is something called idea sex. Yeah, because this side, this is why George Washington said civility is very important because you don't have to agree with the other side, but just listen to them because they got ideas that aren't working and you got ideas that aren't working. But if you put them together, man, this is what Matt Ridley calls idea sex. It's just, you got, somebody's going to get pregnant, man. And I say, forget idea sex. I want an idea orgy. Bring all the ideas together. Let them fight it out or even fuck it out. I don't care, man. That's how, that's how shit happens. That's how Google does it. That's how Pixar does it. And that's how the founding fathers did it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's how they came up with a little something called the Constitution. You think they agreed on shit? Nah, but they talked it out and they figured it out. That's incredible to me. So I think we need idea sex. I think we need cultural sex as well. Anybody who has a problem with cultural appropriation is just not very smart and should pick up a history book. Yeah. We get smarter. We get smarter when we get together, when we download other people's culture. That's how it works. You take the musical tradition of Europe and the musical tradition of Africa, you mix that in with some drugs and alcohol, and you get rock and roll, motherfucker. <laughs> right? And I'm a culture slut. I want all your food in my mouth at the same time. Oh man, I want you to take rice from China, put it together with some cow from Europe, take tomatoes and peppers from South America, mix that in with some cheese. Now they say cheese started in Turkey, but don't tell the French that, they'll freak the fuck out. <laughs> Either way, wrap that up and you got yourself a Mexican burrito. <gasps> yeah, and I think we need sex in general, by the way. A little sex, if you're serious about racism, just have kids with somebody who's lighter skinned or browner skinned, couple generations, we'll all be the same color, kind of a brickish brown. <laughs> you're not gonna discriminate against your neighbors because they got more red hues to their skin. You'll have to find another reason to hate them, and you will. <laughs>
You think the human ape needs a difference in skin color to treat each other unequally? Tell that to Republicans and the Democrats. Oh my Lord, they're not having idea sex at all, by the way. They're not, there's no idea sex. Have you seen a liberal and a conservative try to have a conversation lately? Holy shit. They both, they're both rooted in good values. The left is rooted in the idea of compassion for the weak, and the right's rooted in the idea of respect for the strong. Those are good values. And they break up, though, in very different behaviors. Very different behaviors. You got all the vegans over here, all the hunters over here. All the Prius over here, all the trucks over here. This side likes yoga and Pilates. This side lifts weights and works construction, bitch. This side believes in therapy. This side believes in prayer, booze, and opiates. But that doesn't mean either side isn't really aggressive. They're both aggressive. They both believe in destruction. A right winger will punch you in the face if you insult America long enough. He'll crack you right in the jaw, okay? A left winger would never punch you. They don't believe in violence, but they will publicly shame you and ruin your career. <laughs> Same stuff. Because punishment is much easier than persuasion. But at least as Americans, we still hold the same values. We still speak the same language. We just hijack those values to bolster our side of the argument. The left is like immigration. And this side's like, no, law and order. And the right's like, I want my guns. And this side's like, no, more law and order. And this side's like, abortion. This side's like, life is sacred. This side's like, death penalty. No, life is sacred. <laughs> Yeah, I know. You know what the problem is? You can't be one thing all the time. That's the problem with rooting your heels into one team. It's impossible. I'm not saying there isn't an answer, and I'm not saying you can't get to the truth, but sometimes, man, you gotta lean to the left, then you gotta lean to the right, then you gotta bob in the middle for a little while, zig and zag. I mean, I'm using a boxing analogy, but you get the point. It's not a straight line. I don't fuck, look, I'm not a fucking noun. Don't treat me like a noun. I don't know what I am. I'm a verb. I change like a river. I read a book, I'm like, I got the answer. I read another book, I'm like, not so fast. And I know, I know I wouldn't be a good president. You wouldn't vote for me because I'd be the president of, I don't know, sometimes, maybe it depends. <laughs> I get that, but I just feel like when you, you, like how are you supposed to be one thing all the time? It'd be so boring. Can you imagine sex? Can you imagine how boring sex would be if you had to be consistent all the time? <clears throat> You know, the whole point of being in bed when nobody's watching is you get to be dirty and say fucking crazy shit, man. Can't you be a feminist and enjoy being tied up once in a while? Are you allowed? Does that discredit you? Of course not. You can be into sexual slavery at night and still march for equality during the day. Right? Look, it comes down to realizing that there's no way, no way if you're serious about equality, there's no way to think of yourself as better than somebody else. And I'll tell you why. Because when you look at the qualities we use, like strength, like intelligence, like courage, fine, everybody wants to be brave and smart and strong, but all of us are dumb, weak cowards, depending. All of us, man. Like, I, you, it's impossible to just be smart all the, look, I, you know what, I can come up with jokes I can, I'm smart with it. I'll come back next year with a new bag of tricks. That's the way my brain works. I can sit down and shit just comes to me. God, that part of my brain has big muscles. But I had to put a bed together the other day. <laughs> a child's bed, okay? And it had very easy diagrams, like pictures. After about a half hour, my mother had to stop me from taking my own life. I got so frustrated. <laughs> I freaked out. I called my buddy. I gave him $300 to put my bed together. The bed cost 400 okay? He came over, he goes, bro, I can't take your money. It's four slats in a frame. I was like, I'll stick a knife in my throat right now. Go show off, Einstein. <laughs> Courage is the same thing. I knew dudes who fight four guys in a bar, but they're too afraid to quit a job they hate. It just depends, man. And strength is the same way. There are different kinds of strength. There's hard strength, and then there are soft strengths. And this brings me to sexism and a personal confession. Because guess what? I spent most of my life looking back as a chauvinist. I really did. And that's because 
I only believed in one kind of strength. It's not my fault. I was raised that way. I only thought that the only strengths that matter were the kind you could measure and see, the kind of strengths that I read about in comic books and watched in action movies, the prototypical strengths I thought only belonged to men. You know, the kind of strengths like, get down, and if three guys is all we got, then three guys is all we fucking got. You know, man shit. You know what I mean? The kind of guy who ties knots. I wanted to be the kind of... You know what I mean? Like, I wanna, I've always wanted to be the kind of guy that takes a woman on a boat. I want to be a boatsman. And she's like, where are we going? Where the wind takes us. And just... <laughs> I know, and I want to pull. I don't even know if this is a move, but I'm going to pull. As, and she's like, what, you know, and, and the dolphins are, they're behind, they're meh, you know. And she's like, it's like, how are dolphins in Lake Chicago, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. But then a bunch of things happened to me. A bunch of things. And I thought having a daughter would make me more of a feminist, less of a chauvinist. It didn't. It just made me more protective. I just saw danger where I never did. Like, for example, I got a 10-year-old daughter walking around the world. Any grown man just driving a van around? should be arrested immediately. <laughs> what are you doing? No, it's for my tools. Nobody has that many tools. That's a rolling dungeon. Go to fucking jail. <laughs> and clowns. I used to like clowns. I used to see clowns and smile. Now that I have children, I'm at the outdoor mall. There's a clown there. First of all, guy's in his 50s, so something went very wrong. <laughs> all right? And he's blowing animal balloons. He's a master balloonist. He's like, who wants a balloon? You kids want a balloon, huh? <gasps> My kids are like, I want a balloon. I was like, we'll walk by that cannibal in a single file line, just like this. <laughs> that didn't make me more of a feminist. I never read a, read a book on feminism. I'll be honest, I read a lot of books, and I'm not going to read one on feminism because I feel like they're going to hurt my feelings. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a prejudice, and I'm being, I'm being honest. I feel like every book on feminism is going to have a chapter where I'm going to get to, and it's going to be like, and the ultimate problem is you, and it'll just be a bunch of mirrors. That's unfair, but it's how I feel. That's not what started it. What started it was when the UFC started opening their cages to women. And I started watching women step in that cage in the most male-dominated arena on the planet. And those women were like, yeah. And I never knew that. I never knew women were capable of that. If you had told me eight years ago that I would watch women fight with the same passion and excitement as I do men, if you told me I'd watch women fight and throw bones with the same skill and ferocity as a man, if you told me I'd watch a woman fight for three rounds with a broken arm and keep coming like Paige Van Zandt, I would have told you, I would have laughed in your face. I would have told you to go back to Sweden. I would have called you a communist. I don't know what I would have done, okay? <laughs> And then along came Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate and Holly Holm and Chris Cyborg and Ioana Jenjek, Valentino Shevchenko and Rose Thugnama Junis, etc. Woo! Wow! And by the way, beautiful. Many of them feminine women. And it's very weird for a dude like me to be attracted to somebody that can choke me out and break my jaw. I'm not comfortable with that. But it's incredible, man. And when I watched Rose Namajunas take the title, when she threw that left, she just went bop and knocked you on it. I, I, I didn't expect her to win, man. I, I thought she was going to get killed. And when she did it, I, <laughs> I started producing estrogen, I swear to God. <laughs> well, I looked like I won a beauty patch. And I was like, oh my, oh my God, oh my God. And my friend, he came running in. He's like, what the fuck? He thought something happened. I was like, ah, like that. And my friend goes, well, you like to watch chicks fight? I'm like, chicks? They are women! <laughs> and they have bigger balls than you'll ever have, motherfucker! <laughs> I know, I became a screaming liberal for a couple seconds. Now, 
But here's the point. Here's what's fascinating about that. Violence against women, always bad, unless it's being done by another woman in a cage and it's televised. <laughs> then it can go a long way in changing the mind and the heart of a chauvinist like myself, all right? So thank you, UFC, and all you ladies out there who fight. Now, but, but that's not the only strength that matters, man. Those are all hard strengths, but there are soft strengths. And this country is a great country. It's a great country, not just because we represent hard strengths, not just because we're the best at that, not just because we're, the, we're, we're, we're home to the NFL and a roaring stock market and a lethal, powerful army with the biggest guns. That is not what makes us strong. Let me put it this way, man. This is the best way to put it. Because when we talk about hard strength and soft strength, I didn't know Stephen Jobs. I didn't know Virginia Woolf. I didn't know Mother Teresa. I didn't know Albert Einstein, William Shakespeare. I didn't know Mahatma Gandhi. I didn't know Martin Luther King. But I will guarantee that all of them, all of them sucked at CrossFit. <laughs> But here's the thing, man. But having children with a woman showed me a different kind of strength. Because watching what a woman can do with children is, I truly believe, I don't care if this sounds chauvinistic, but I think if it was up to men, I just think the kids would die eventually. I just, we just, we don't have the patience. We get too distracted, man. I mean, and they, and just the patience, the strength of patience that a mother has. My daughter, these kids want to play games with me. I love them, but they can be so fucking boring. I, <laughs> My, my son's a gangster. I gave him a jump rope. He's, he's built for organized crime. I don't know what I'm gonna do. He's six years old. I'm like, look, you can jump rope. Look at this. And my son goes, I could. I could also fold it in half and whip the shit out of everybody I see. <laughs> I gave my daughter a jump rope. She was like, okay, this is the circle of truth. Now, if you stand in it, you have to tell the truth. Like, no matter what, you have to tell the truth. Why are you standing in it? I haven't even made you a ticket yet. You need a ticket. That's the line. Dad, that's the line. You have to stand over there. I have to explain the rules. I have to make you a ticket. And then you have to wait in line. It's so boring. So boring. Like, I'd rather be at the dentist with no Novocaine. I've had a better time. I'm by the time she finished making me the ticket and I had to wait in the imaginary line, nobody else was in. And she, and she described the rules all rigged to her favor. I'm telling you, it was so painful. But it's a good thing that circle of truth didn't work. Because if, I, if it had worked, I would have been like, I shouldn't have had you. <laughs> well, you guys have been amazing, man. And uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We are bipolar apes, sinners and saints, and everything in between, man. And we are complicated. And I think it's impossible to categorize. I think that we have to treat each other like individuals. And I think that's what the founding fathers were talking about. And I think that's what Thomas Jefferson was talking about when he wrote that incredible line, that radical idea in political philosophy, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. All men are created equal is not something you can prove mathematically or biologically. It's not. But somehow in our hearts, we know that that's the right way to be, man. Because if you look at the real world, like if LeBron James was sitting next to me right now, there is nothing equal about us, man. There's nothing. That guy looks like my avatar, all right? I, I got a bigger dick, but he's way taller. I know. And I had the most incredible experience recently about why you should always treat people like individuals and never think you're better than somebody because you don't know what that person contributes. And I was on my plane, man. And I was about to sit, take my seat, and I noticed that this young lady I was about to sit next to was a little bigger than most. Now, that's relevant to my story because I happen to basically know everything about nutrition, okay? <laughs> I'm basically a scientist. I'm right. You're wrong. If I tell you to eat it, eat it, okay? I know everything. I've read over four books, number one, okay? <laughs> I lecture my own doctor on insulin. I had my doctor in a corner the other day. I was like, and another thing you don't understand about sugar and simple carbs, doc. And he was like, I'm with a patient or some bullshit. And 
But the point is, I know about nutrition. And here was this woman a little bigger than most. And I thought to myself, you know what? This is your lucky day. Because I got nutritional secrets in my brain that are going to set you free. Hashtag athletic Santa Claus. I give. <laughs> so I take my seat. I pull out my reading material. Probably the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The Economist. Maybe a novel. I read widely. I feed my body and my brain. Notice how I'm not moving the seat back. I don't have to. I got strong lumbar support. I'm basically a samurai. Okay? <laughs> I don't even touch the seat. Sometimes I just work my fucking legs. Look at that shit. <laughs> anyway, we're in the air and I'm about to turn and get this revolution started when I notice that this young lady I'm sitting next to is a licking her thumb and thumbing through a stack of tabloid magazines about that thick, all about Hollywood, all about who's fat, who's skinny, who's best dressed, who's worst dressed, who's getting divorced, all this bullshit. So I'm like, Wow, you read tabloid magazines? <laughs> I guess you're part of the problem, and I do what you're supposed to. I dismissed her as a human being. <laughs> I was like, you read tabloid magazines, I don't have to ignore the shit out of you for the rest of the flight. Enjoy yourself. I'm going to read about the Chinese economy, etc. Hashtag part of the solution. <laughs> Feeling very good about myself, by the way. Now, as we're in the air, flight attendant gets on and goes, ladies and gentlemen, sorry the flight was delayed, but to make it up to you, we are handing out free cookies. Yeah, and the whole plane, I can just hear the energy, the air change, the cookies, woo! People are like clapping, they're all a titter, they're all excited, not the fucking samurai. I can't wait to say no. Sure enough, she rolls your old cookie cart up all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, looking down on me like she's got all the power. She's like, cookies? I'm like, you know what? Nah, you can keep your brown discs of death to yourself. I don't eat sugar simple cars, but I know somebody who definitely does. Sure enough, young lady next to me goes, if he's not going to eat his cookies, I'll take his share as well. I'm like, I fucking knew it. Then she decides to wash it down with some cranberry juice. <sighs> Sorry, that's at least 155 grams of sugar right there. I can, I can hear her pancreas panicking, okay? I can literally, I can't, I can't produce any more insulin. Please, somebody help me. My pancreas, sound asleep. <laughs> All right, and she's eating those cookies and drinking that cranberries. I'm watching all that sugar going to her body, and she's licking and thumbing through them tabloid magazines. And I'm thinking to myself, in 20 minutes, you're going to have your sugar crash. 20 minutes on the dot, on the dot, she's out like a light. And I'm like, why don't they make a movie about me, man? <laughs> so happy with myself. Now, here's where the story gets interesting, and here's where the lesson starts to happen. About 10 minutes into her nappy poo, there's a young lady about four rows back who starts to have a medical emergency. I don't know what's going on, but she's flipping out in her chair. She's going, like that. And I was like, what the fuck? Like that. And the woman next to her is like, something's wrong with her, I think. And the flight attendant comes over and goes, what's going on, honey? Everything okay? And this woman goes, and falls into the aisle and starts to freak out. And they're like, oh my God, we need help. Please come over here. And I try to pick up. Oh, there's you. And I don't know what to do. I'm like, um, I have almonds if you need them. I don't know. And they're working, and the flight attendant moves over, and she grabs the thing. She goes, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a passenger who's very sick. We don't know what to do. If there's any medical staff on board or a doctor, we could really use your help. We don't know what to do. And the young lady that I've been judging this whole time, she woke up from her nap like a tier one commando. <laughs> she just looked at me. She goes, move. I go, what? Move. I go, oh, fuck. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> She comes walking over, slides, and she goes, what's going on? Is this her purse? Is this her purse? Okay, I see what's going on. How much long do we have? Hour and a half? Good. Honey, I need orange juice. I need a wet towel. Let's lift her legs. Let's bring her head up, please. Come on, guys. Hold me up. Now, open. Here we go. Hurry up with that orange juice, please. Let's pull these back. You guys got to move back. Give me the orange juice. Okay, here. Take this pill. Put it on her toes. She's got to drink all of this, okay? I want her to swallow the pill. Drink all of this. I'm going to fly the plane to smoother air. <laughs> And she comes back, and she's working. I don't know what she's doing, dude, but she's just doing stuff. And she, at one point, at one point, they try to get her back in the chair, and nobody could do it. She goes, move, get out of my way. She just gets under, and yeah, she just, she just fucking cross, yeah, she just, and puts her in the chair like a baby. And she, and now the woman, 10 minutes, the woman's going, come on, girl, 
spree with me. We did it. We did this again. No, leave me. No, I'm not going to leave you. You're my ride or die, sister. You're my ride or die. We're doing this together. We got an hour and 10 minutes, and we did this together. We're not going anywhere. Can you drink a little more? So, mm, 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 mm. That's my girl. There you go. Let me check your bus. Oh, we got stabilized. We did it. We stabilized you. You okay? Can I get a smile? Say, Yes, my girl. Yes, he did. And thank you. No, thank you. We had an adventure. Everybody needs help sometimes. And I had a good time. Did you have a good time? <laughs> Just kidding around. But you know what? We got, we got an hour and 10 minutes, and we're going to make it through. Can I get a hug? And they hug, and the whole plane starts to clap. And she just looks at me, and she goes, oh, please stop, whatever. I'll be there. I'll be there. Hour and 10. If you need it, you say boo. I'm right here, okay? But you're not going to need me, okay? All right? Okay, good. I'll be over there. And she comes walking over, and she goes, excuse me. And I was like, of course. <laughs> And I take my seat, and I look at her, and I go, that was incredible, man. How did you know what to do? And she goes, I'm an ER nurse, honey. I've seen it all. I was like, an ER nurse. The cookie monster saves lives. <laughs> I was like, what do you think was wrong with her? And she goes, I think she's about to have a diabetic seizure. Drank too much, didn't eat enough. I just had to stabilize her. I was like, diabetic seizure. That's what it felt like from here as well. Uh, and then she looks at me and she goes, I have to ask you a question. I was like, sure, what? And she goes, you're an actor, right? And I was like, yes. <laughs> she's like, I knew it. I've seen you in so many things. And you're so funny. And I've been looking for you in all these tabloid magazines since we took off. And I can't find you anywhere. <laughs> And she could see my face freeze for a second because it bugged me just a little bit. And this beautiful human being who puts everybody first and herself last, this person who's keyed in to human misery and pain, she read it on my face. She put her hand on my hand and she goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't tell me you put any stock in these tabloid magazines. These things mean less than nothing. They're brain sugar. They're eye candy. You make people laugh. You make me laugh. You made my mother laugh when she was sick. So don't you ever second guess yourself on my watch, my friend. She felt bad for me. <laughs> and I was judging her because she had a couple cookies and took a fucking nap. <laughs> and when I asked her how she helped that woman, you know what she said? She goes, I gave her some sugar. She was fine. So I don't know that much about nutrition. Shut the fuck up, Brian. <laughs> so if you believe in equality, God damn it, don't categorize, treat each other like individuals. I love you so much, Chicago. God bless you.